many reasons why it might be hard for you to connect with other people, and why it might be hard for other people to connect with you. Usually during these episodes, I like to be as comprehensive as is possible about the entire subject, in this case connection. But today, I've decided I'm not going to do it. I'm going to jump right into the meat of it, and I'm just going to teach you literally how to connect with someone. 1. Give the person that you want to connect with your unconditional, undivided, focused, presence. When you give someone your unconditional attention, your focus, you are gifting them with the fullness of your consciousness, the fullness of your presence. And if you would like to connect with someone, this is absolutely imperative. Don't confuse this with aggression. It's not forcing yourself on someone. This is gifting your energy to someone. Two, use body language that is open to them. Make sure you smile. Turn your chest towards them. Make sure your arms and legs aren't crossed. You want to give them the idea that you're open to them, not closed to them. Again, this body language is open and inviting, not aggressive. Three, become interested in them. You will get far more connections and far more friends by becoming interested in other people than by trying to get other people interested in you. So learn about them. You can even pretend that you are mentally designing a manual for them. The energy you want to give off is that you really want to know them and relate to them, not that you want to get something from them. If you don't have a genuine interest in the person you're trying to connect with, stop trying. Everyone can pick up on the truth of how you really feel, it's just that most people aren't brave enough to call it like it is. 4. Seek out common ground. This instantly establishes rapport with other people, and it's a great skill to develop if you feel like you have to connect with or want to connect with someone whose views and opinions are very different from your own. For example, let's say that I'm going to school and getting a degree in accounting, and another person is going to school to get a degree in biology. Obviously, those two things may not exactly line up, but maybe both of us like tennis. Tennis is what we're talking about then. Pay very close attention to what someone says and does in order to recognize the common ground between you. 5. Aim for intimacy. This is not surfacy stuff. Intimacy is being known for who we really are and knowing the other person for who they really are. If you are interested in a surfacy relationship, then let's face it, you're not really interested in connection. Intimacy is not sex, but sex can be intimate sex. Intimacy is a whole other thing. You can break the word intimacy down into into me see. Quite literally, to develop intimacy, we practice seeing into the other person, feeling into them, understanding them. With intimacy, you have a shared experience of emotional and mental, and if the situation calls for it, physical closeness. 6. Ask questions. A person who doesn't want to answer questions is either apprehensive about connection or literally doesn't want it. You can learn to develop a connection with someone who's afraid of intimacy but wants it, but it will be nearly impossible to develop a connection with somebody who literally doesn't want connection with you. So make sure the person you are trying to connect with actually wants to connect. And if connection is what you want, do not spend your time trying to convince someone to want to connect with you. Find someone who does. Ask questions that reveal the deep inner world of someone to you. Ask about opinions, beliefs, likes, dislikes, dreams, struggles. You want to aim to know this person for who they really are at the deepest level possible. Asking someone questions only feels like an interrogation if you are asking questions but are avoiding answering them yourself. Also, some people have the tendency to ask questions only so that they can talk about themselves. This is also a barrier to connection. 7. When they tell you about themselves, Receive them completely, without trying to fix them or change their minds. 
You want to listen to them fully with your heart, with your eyes, with your ears, and with your mind. A huge part of connecting is providing a safe space to connect. This is the responsibility of both people. People are afraid to share the truth of themselves with you because they are afraid of the consequences. And so, let there be no consequence. Even if you disagree with their opinion, treat their opinion as important for them and remind yourself that there is a valid reason that they feel that way. Antagonism kills connection. Remember that people need their emotions received more so than anything else. For more information about how to approach emotions in relationships, watch my video on YouTube titled Emotional Wake-Up Call. 8. Initiate. This is especially true for men. If you're a man and you don't initiate, then you have actually reversed your polarity by going into a state that is purely passive and receptive. We would love to connect with people, but we usually wait for them to come to us. We should get over it. The reality is, once we do the shadow work on rejection, then we will start going to the places and going up to the people who we actually want to connect with. And that really is our only opportunity to actually get that connection. Here's a secret. Nearly everyone on earth is insecure and afraid to be the one to speak first. So it might as well be you. 8. Be honest, genuine, and authentic. Transparency rules the day when it comes to genuine connection. A great way to establish connection with somebody is to pay them a compliment. But this compliment must be genuine. If it's not genuine, people can feel it. They're much more sensitive than we think. You're not going to be able to keep up a facade forever. So when you go to connect with people, don't think about putting your best foot forward. Think about putting your usual foot forward. Besides, let's really think about this. If we want a genuine connection and we put forth our best foot only or our facade, then what happens is that later they're disillusioned in us. What they're in love with is the facade, not the real us. So it's destined to fail. It's better to get it out of the way in the beginning and to rule out the ones who really aren't going to love you for who you really are, so that you're only left to the ones who can. People are sensitive to energy, whether they know it or not. The scariest thing in the world for people is pretense. They can feel it if you're acting and looking and saying one thing, when the feeling of you that is underneath is contrary to that. 10. Be open. Let yourself be an open book. Openness is emotional generosity. It's not going to work for connection to be stingy with yourself in any way. If you want to be truly connected with somebody, you're going to have to be willing to let them come fully into you and to go fully into them. This creates a space of vulnerability. And vulnerability is very, very scary. But we're never going to be able to connect if we're not brave enough to risk that vulnerability. Because, let's face it, the way we're living, unconnected to people, isolated and alone internally, it's really not worth the risk of even losing them or meeting with negative ends. Isolation is in fact the most painful thing that a human can experience. If you're resistant to being open, figure out what you're trying to hide and why. What are you ashamed of or afraid of? The only reason you would hide something from anyone is because you're afraid of some kind of consequence. Should you really be ashamed of any aspect of yourself that is true? You can't hide things from people forever. I'd say it's better to tell people up front than to disillusion them later. Besides, you're looking for someone who wants to connect with all of you. The real point of connection is to find someone who can be fully with you with the positive and with the negative, not someone who needs all of your life to be positive in order to love you. This is conditional love. Include them in your life. Sometimes offering information about yourself, even if they don't ask for it, helps other people feel included by you and wanted by you. Share your passion with the other person. Demonstrating passion opens people up to you and often makes them feel inspired and energized. 11. Relate to them. Be compassionate towards them and find ways to validate their reality, to validate themselves as a person. There's a lot of emphasis put on the idea 
that it's not a good idea to allow yourself to merge with another person so as to feel their emotions. But I actually disagree. This is only a problem if we're unwilling to feel emotions, or if we're shaky in our own identity in the first place. But if we want to truly connect with someone, we have to be willing to feel what they feel, to know what they know, to see what they see. Yes, it sounds scary, but it is also the open door to connection. We have to be willing to walk in their shoes. So it might even be helpful for us to do a visualization where we imagine ourselves literally being them, not going over to their side of the fence with all of our beliefs, with our perspective. Instead, we go over to their side of the fence and live the life they've lived with the opinions they have and look at the world as they see the world and feel the world as they feel it. Pay special attention to the fact that sometimes when we think that we're relating to somebody, all we're actually doing is using the story that they're telling us to tell our story. So we're actually not really interested in what they're going to say. We just want to use it as a segue to talk about ourselves. We're much more interested in them hearing our story than we are about having them feel heard and understood. This makes them feel insignificant and like you've just used them as a stage to stand upon and crow. If you want them to care about your experience, you've got to genuinely care about theirs. Steer completely clear of reinforcing the idea that you don't understand their viewpoint. Some well-meaning people do this and it completely kills connection and makes people feel like they are all alone. Here's an example. Someone expresses that they never knew their family. You jump in and say, oh, how sad. I loved my family. They were awesome. I just didn't know where I'd be without them, especially my mom. You've just created separation, not connection. You've just made them feel alone in their opinion or feeling. 12. Be thoughtful and mindful of the other person. Be demonstrative with your love. Most of us, even though we like people, we don't really show it. We don't demonstrate it. And then we expect the other person to know that we care about them. We have to stop expecting that if we really want connection. We have to actually put forth energy to remember dates that are significant to remember things that they've told us from previous conversations, to make sure that we have learned them enough to know what they like so that we can get them things they like, or to spend quality time with them, or to know that they might need a hug and so we give them one. Make them a priority in your life. It's difficult to connect with someone when the message you keep giving him or her is you're not important to me. So make sure the people you want to connect with are actually important and are actually a priority to you. Be helpful where you can be helpful. But before you help someone, simply ask yourself the question, by helping in this way, am I sending the message that they need to be fixed or that something about them is not okay? If not, go ahead and help. Or help while making it known that you don't need them to be fixed in any way. You simply thought it would bring them some happiness. For more information on helping other people, watch my YouTube video titled To Help or Not to Help. 13. Practice exuding warmth and love to other people. People are very energy sensitive. So when you practice exuding warmth from your being, exuding love, it becomes an invitation for people to connect with us. Sarbdeep, in fact, has one of my favorite practices for developing this kind of connection. When you're walking down the street and you pass random strangers, you focus intently on that one stranger and you look for something that you appreciate or love about that person. And then mentally, as you are witnessing that thing, you say to yourself, I love you for fill in the blank. And then mentally say why you like that and finish it with, I love you for that. As you say those words, imagine sending that energy out your heart chakra towards them as if sending the message as an invisible signal to their hearts. For example, if you pass a woman, you might say, I love you for the way you are holding your child's hands because I can see that you are nurturing and loving and it is helping him to feel secure. I love you for that. You do this exercise as a silent practice with as many people as you can, but it's better to pick just five people and to intensely focus on them so that you really feel the appreciation and love for them than to pick 20 where you moderately feel the emotion towards them and you moderately focus at the thing you like about them. A bonus is that as you do this practice, you are literally causing a ripple in the collective consciousness. 
and you will be absolutely surprised about just how different your interactions with people will be. So that is for the surfacey side of deep connection. <laughs> there is a technique which I'm going to teach you where we can actually allow our souls to completely connect with one another. Now this exercise, I will warn you, is not only difficult, but also incredibly threatening to the ego. So to do this exercise, in essence, you have to become okay with being willing to die. This technique must be done with someone who absolutely wants to do this connection with you. They have to want to let you completely in and to go completely into you. So don't try to rope anybody into doing this particular practice. To start, I want you to remove all of the jewelry that you're wearing, especially crystals, especially protection crystals. You want to be in your most raw and vulnerable state. Ideally, if we were doing this with our partner, we would do it naked. <laughs> but if we're doing it with a friend, we can stay clothed. Choose a place with no distractions and sit down in front of one another cross-legged and across from each other so that you are looking at each other. Loosely connect your hands or arms with each other in a comfortable and relaxed way. This next part you can do with your eyes open or with your eyes closed. You want to imagine or sense or feel each one of your chakras, starting with the base, going all the way up through the seven. If you'd like to extend beyond that, you can go ahead. But it's best to work with the seven primary ones if you can't go further. So you're visualizing those chakras opening. And then you're visualizing or feeling or sensing, breathing in the other person's energy through each one of your chakras. You can start with one, then move to the next, then to the next. But we want to get to the point where we are literally feeling ourselves breathing the fullness of that other person's energy through our chakra system simultaneously. Four, begin to sense or see or feel your identity dissolving. This can be a very frightening step for people. The ego is concerned with survival and the ego is of course the separate self. But what I am teaching you to do right now is to fully merge with someone. To fully merge, you have to be willing to let go of your own singular identity. So don't be surprised if fear comes up. It's okay to just be present with the fear. Be okay with it being there and continue just the same. The ego thinks that connection means that it will die. We have to quite literally decide that connection is more important than living and that connection is worth the risk of death. It takes immense bravery we often have to decide that it is better to have connection and to lose it than never to have it at all to be able to do this part of the exercise and the rest that is to follow. Five, you want to look at each other directly in the eyes. It's okay if you want to focus on one eye specifically or you can relax your gaze and look into both. The point is that you're going to practice going straight through their pupil. Then we decide who is going to journey first. What that means is we decide who's going to be the journeyer and who's going to be the receiver. The journeyer's job is to take their consciousness in to the other person. The receiver's job is to open up and allow the journeyer to come in with their consciousness to their being. The journeyer enters the receiver through the pupil of the eye as if sinking into a black hole. If you're really struggling as the journeyer or as the receiver, with this penetration, then what I want you to do is to break your concentration and to hold each other heart to heart. So you want to press your heart chakras together physically and hold each other like that and breathe the energy back and forth between your hearts for a time. This often dissolves the barrier so that we're willing to go deeper. The receiver focuses on inviting the journeyer in, breathing the journeyer in, and imagines or senses or feels themselves opening up to take them in. The receiver simply focuses on allowing, surrender, and on the feeling of the journeyer's presence entering them. The journeyer focuses on using their consciousness to penetrate deeper and deeper into the person, like a being who is exploring a foreign planet. Curiosity and non-judgment are crucial. The journeyer projects love and gratitude into the receiver as they move deeper and deeper, conveying any messages mentally, emotionally, 
or energetically that they feel would help the receiver to open up further or any message they feel the receiver needs to hear. I want to stress that you can say these messages in your mind's eye or you can also say them out loud. For example, as the journeyer, if you feel like you've hit a wall where somebody's not letting you in because they're afraid you're going to leave, it might be beneficial for you to say, I'm never going to leave you. Also, if you're struggling to go in as the journeyer to the other person, it might be beneficial for you to drop your own self-interest and to purely focus on what the other person has that is an unmet need and how you might go about meeting those needs. If you completely focus on the other person and what they need and on exploring them, then sometimes that's enough to get us beyond our barriers to going into someone because we know that we're serving a purpose. So the ego will back it up instead of resist it. During this process, your walls and blockages to connections will all come up for both the receiver and for the journeyer. These walls are belief patterns and emotional patterns that have resulted from life trauma experienced by the receiver and experienced by yourself as the journeyer. Usually, more walls come up for the receiver. These can be visual or mental, or even just walls that you feel between you and the experience. You will both run into them. This is especially true because most people are multi-layered. So as you enter into them, you will experience layer after layer after layer. As you sink into deeper and deeper and deeper layers within them, some light, some dark, some positive feeling, some negative feeling. And in front of some of these layers are energetic and emotional walls. When you encounter a wall, your first prerogative is to completely become aware of it. You want to learn from it. You need to know why a wall is there. Consciousness dissolves subconscious walls. Because once a subconscious wall becomes conscious, the consciousness goes to work dissolving it. What is the wall trying to prevent? Why has it chosen this feeling or this appearance? Let your intuition speak to you and hand you insight about each wall that you encounter. Subconscious walls cannot withstand consciousness. They usually begin to dissolve once we are conscious of them and their purpose. You can reassure this wall that it's okay to dissolve, that it doesn't need to exist anymore. It's really important that we understand that though there are multiple ways of breaking down walls, for some people breaking down walls literally creates further trauma. So it's better to love a wall into a state of dissolving instead of try to destroy the wall. Some walls do not feel like walls at all, but more like funnels or plastic barriers or electric barriers. All of this is normal. If a wall absolutely does not want to come down, we need to honor that fact. Sometimes that right there is what a wall needs in order to come down. In fact, it's just to know that it's going to be honored. But sometimes, if we really can't get past a wall, we can involve the receiver and have the receiver focus on breaking down or dissolving that particular wall. 10. As you move through these layers and these various walls, the best way to get through them is to melt through them. That means, as the journeyer, you melt through the receiver. And as the receiver, you let the journeyer melt through you. The way that we melt through these layers is by completely allowing ourselves to be present with what we are experiencing. Most especially the way that that particular experience or layer feels. We release resistance to it completely. For example, if you encounter a layer of numbness, you allow yourself to be completely with that numbness and to feel it totally. You let the numbness consume you. And in the absence of that resistance, you will melt through that layer to the one below it. If fear comes up, be present with the fear. Let it consume you even. Become so okay with the feeling of the fear that it has nothing to push itself against, and you will melt through that layer. A person who is afraid of feeling, especially afraid of feeling their own feelings, will have a very difficult time with this particular process. What we have to do is to become perfectly okay with whatever experience we have. And don't be surprised if you have extreme sensory hallucinations or visual hallucinations during this process. This is all okay. Nothing is going wrong. 
we have to be brave enough to be willing to stay present with those hallucinations, regardless of what they are. You have a choice. Either you can match the frequency of the particular layer that you are in, completely experiencing it in your being. So for example, if you hit a layer of grief, you can let the grief become you. You can feel what the receiver feels at that layer and practice true empathy. Or you can match the frequency of the person's eternal soul, often called the higher self, which holds a frequency of pure appreciation and love for the receiver. And you can descend through each layer lovingly, embracing your way through each one. Trust your intuition to know which one is the most needed by the receiver. Either way, you are matching their frequency, just a different aspect of their frequency, and thus making a genuine empathetic connection. As the journeyer, we want to see and hear and feel and understand the receiver completely. As the receiver, we want to be felt, we want to be heard, we want to be seen, we want to be understood completely. As fears come up for both of you, let them occupy the space between the both of you, as if it is being held and cradled by the both of you. This is an energetic taking care of the resistance that is there. If we are both okay with it, we're both taking care of it, then we are both responsible for the releasing of resistance to those particular fears, and so they will more easily go away. We are present with this exercise for as long as it takes for us to feel as if we have gone through the other person completely. Most often what this means is you go totally through every layer that there is to a person until you are returned to their eternal source aspect, until it feels like you have rejoined God. Now it's really crucial that we never pull out of the experience when we're going through especially a negative layer inside of a person. We have to at least make sure that we get through to a positive feeling layer within that person. Because it's so common for most of us, due to our childhoods, to have the message that we are not going to be connected with because there's some aspect of ourselves that's not okay, or that's too scary, or that's evil. If we withdraw, we actually risk traumatizing the person further and actually closing themselves off to connection even more. When we have completed this journey, we then switch roles and the receiver becomes the journeyer. The journeyer becomes the receiver. When we have both completed the process, we discuss our experiences. We write them down. We begin to process them together, not alone. It's really important that you do this particular exercise with enough time. Sometimes this can take four hours. Other times it takes one. So we have to make sure that we care more about going fully through the experience than we care about being somewhere else on time. It's also really crucial that we don't do this exercise with strangers until we become so familiar with connecting with people that we're no longer afraid of it. We need to pick people who we already have some degree of trust for. That's the only way it's really going to work. When you do this with a complete stranger still having barriers to connection, you also risk re-traumatizing yourself. This is the real reason why I'm not a major fan of this new age trend of eye-gazing with people you have just met. All that does is put you into a space of insecurity. And most people think they may be connecting, but they're really not connecting at all. They're just running into each other's walls, and that's your first introduction to each other. Believe me when I tell you that I could never explain this process in enough detail for you to completely understand it. This is something which must be experienced in order to be understood. And don't think that you'll only be doing this one time with a person. We should aim to do this any time we feel like we want deeper connection or deeper understanding with someone, especially if we've entered into a partnership with someone. And be prepared for all of your shadows of loneliness or isolation to come in the wake of this process. Connection flushes to the surface anything unlike itself, so that it may be integrated into our conscious awareness. This is the path of healing, but the path of healing is not always comfortable. So it is important, if you have shared this connection, to really be there for each other in the wake of the experience, especially in the following week or month after you have done it. This is a sacred experience. It is to be treated with the utmost care. We are now trusted with the authentic truth of another human being. They have entered a vulnerable space so as to give themselves to us, both their power and their frailty. 
We must honor that trust or else we are not in the space of integrity. Separation is the real hell on earth. And the worst version of that hell is when we feel an internal sense of isolation, even though we are physically surrounded by other people. This is the very condition that so many of us experience today. Connection is in fact the antidote to suffering. We need to be willing to be completely with each other, regardless of whether we are in a space of pain or we are in a space of joy. It is to say to somebody, I don't care whether you're in rain or you're in shine, but I'm with you no matter what. Give this gift to someone today. Have a good week. Music